Good evening, everyone. My name is Ken Hui. I'm a board member of the CHF. Welcome to the 11th of 31 presentations of AAPI Talks celebrating the AAPI Heritage Month. This event is sponsored by the Chinese American Heritage Foundation. The Chinese American Heritage Foundation is dedicated to celebrating the rich history of Chinese Americans' contributions to the American spirit. Information on how you can participate is available at cahf.us. During this presentation, please use the Zoom Q&A function to ask your questions, and we will read them during the Q&A period. This Zoom event will be recorded. Tonight, we will have an esteemed panel who will discuss the landmark case of Yik Wu versus Hopkins that was decided in 1886 by the US Supreme Court. Our panel moderator is Mr. David Lay. David is a senior advisor to the Chinese American Heritage Foundation. David is an accomplished entrepreneur with a deep-seated commitment to community development. After graduating with a degree in business administration from UC Berkeley, he started his own consumer goods exporting business company in 1981, but not before spending time in the social sector, working with at-risk Asian and African American youth through Chinatown's YMCA and Richmond's Model Cities program. David sold his business and retired in 2003. David was the board vice chair of the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco and is very passionate about Chinese art and culture. Our panelists tonight are Nick Bartel, after teaching in, San, in the San Francisco Unified School District for 42 years, Nick retired to work on curriculum development as a volunteer to support his colleagues teaching immigrant students in San Francisco. He has done units in English as a second language, middle school science and social studies. Nick was also asked to do some units for the Association of Chinese Teachers in San Francisco and for the Asian American Studies Department at San Francisco State University. Our other panelist is Charles McLean. Professor McLean is the Vice Chair Emeritus Jurisprudence and Social Policy Program Lecturer in Residence, School of Law, UC Berkeley. He is the author of In Search of Equality, The Chinese Struggle Against Discrimination in 19th Century America. Professor McLean was the editor of Chinese, of Asian Americans and the law, historical, and contemporary perspectives, four volume anthology. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our moderator and program and panel. Hi, uh, I'll start off and then follow by Charles McLean and then Nick will uh, end the session today. Uh, Yick Wall versus Hopkins. Every time I do these Zoom, I feel like I'm preaching to the choir. Uh, the reason why you zoom in normally is you already know a lot about Yikwa versus Hopkins. Uh, I really did not get involved with Chinese American history until after retirement uh, in 2003. Prior to that, I was more interested in traditional Chinese art and culture. But uh, I ran into Professor McLean's book, In Search of Equality, about 2003. And when I read it, I says, oh my gosh, I've been pushing for the railroad that this is the Chinese American contribution to America all these years. Whereas all the litigation, the Chinese organized and brought to the federal court and more than two dozen, uh, more than 20 to the Supreme Court, uh, giving us Yik Wall, which was equal protection under law, Tate versus Hurley, which is right to a public education, and Wong Kim Art defining what makes you an American being born here. And then later on, Miranda case that was based on the Chinese murder case. Uh, even concept of political asylum that it was uh, Pershing 
it was uh, General Pershing and the Pershing Chinese, uh, Public Law 29. And then more recently, in 1974, Lao versus Nickel to give us uh, ESL, English as a, a second language for all schools uh, where there's a uh, population who are not proficient in English. So it changed my branding of what our contribution, the Chinese American contribution to America is. Very basic in our laws, uh, civil rights and immigrant rights. So today we will get deeper into this uh, case. And let me go down, I'll see, it's not moving. Here we go. I often start off on left field showing this, the north side of San Francisco City Hall. In front of San Francisco City Hall, we only have two statues. We only honor two people in front of our city hall. In front of city hall on the Polk Street side is President Lincoln. Then on the north side of city hall on McAllister Street, we have this statue that is bigger than Lincoln. But most people walk by have no idea who this person is. But if you go up and read it, it says Hall McAllister. The street is named after him. And you say, so what, who's, who's this Hall McAllister? Well, this is the person that the Chinese hire, one of several, but he ended up to be the lead lawyer for the Supreme Court case for Yick Wall versus Hopkins. So now, uh, and he's the one responsible for this concept of equal protection under the law not only the law itself, but the execution of the law. So every time I walk by now, I take a bow, thank him for that. And, uh, and what he's done for the Chinese in all these cases. Now, here's a picture of Chinatown. To the right side is Portsmouth Square, to the left side is this beige color brick building. That's the corner of Kearney and Clay. This would be the southwest corner of Kearney and Clay. And this was Hall McAllister's office. He said, oh my gosh, is in the middle of Chinatown. <laughs> Why? Well, the Chinese brought more than 10,000 cases against the federal government between 1882, the exclusion law, and 1905. So uh, Hall McAllister with a handful of other lawyers made fortunes uh, handling these Chinese cases because they came one after the next. Oops, I think, did I skip one? Nope. Here is Spotford Alley, number 33. Today is the Yi Ying Music so, uh, association. And it's the location of the Tong Hong Tong, but it's also known as the Tong Hing Tong, H-I-N-G. There's different spelling of it because of uh, the way Americans would spell Chinese words. It was founded in 1852 as the Laundry Association. It was a guild. And when the Yik Wall case came about, uh, and even before the Iqua case, because uh, San Francisco had these laundry cases from the 1870s, uh, ordinances that were quite unfair and trying to get rid of the Chinese. And so this uh, Tong Hing Tong or Tong Hong Tong assessed their members $10 each to hire people like Hall McAllister to fight these. In fact, in the 1870s, they hired the ex-governor of California to uh, fight these laws. So the Chinese in those days raised a lot of money and they realized they better get the best and the brightest to uh, fight these uh, laws, which they felt were very unfair. And the other group that were involved was the Chinese Six Company, which was at that time 
uh, pretty much uh, operated by the Chinese Council in the US. This is the Qing government. And during the uh, 1885, 86, 87, was uh, this Council General Huan uh, Zunxian. And he was a great poet. And he, he really got involved with the Chinese community. And the Chinese Council hired Frederick B, a lawyer who in 1876 was one of very few lawyers that was willing to represent the Chinese. And he represented the Chinese on a congressional uh, committee to study the Chinese. And he represented the Chinese. And afterwards, the Chinese council hired him to represent the council. And he brought a lot of cases uh, and uh, supported uh, the Chinese on all these cases and uh, directed the Chinese to various uh, lawyers. And they raised a lot of money, both the Six Company, the Council General, and the, uh, uh, the Laundry Guild. For the Yikwa case, uh, there's a newspaper article, they raised $20,000 equivalent to half a million, more than half a million today, just to handle this case. So there was a lot of support. The Chinese that were here realized they were being picked on all the time with these uh, ordinances and they took it very seriously and they hired the best and the brightest to fight them. So, the atmosphere of this time, 1885, was one of very anti-Chinese. If you think we have a problem today with anti-Chinese racism and uh, these uh, violence against the Chinese, well, the Chinese that were here starting from the 1840, uh, late 1840s and 50s all the way through had it much worse. In 1885 to 1887, there were more than 100 incidences where entire cities, Chinese living in a certain city, they were totally kicked out of the city. And this is documented by uh, Beth Lou Williams in her book, The Chinese Must Go. And so one city after the next, the Chinese were driven out, burned out, and many were killed. Rock Spring, 28 to 34, Chinese were murdered to be kicked out of town. And surprisingly, uh, well, they fled to the next major town, Evanston, and the uh, US government got the military involved and uh, the Chinese thought they were put on trains to be put, uh, brought back to San Francisco and maybe back to China, but instead they ended up in Rock Spring because the coal mine where they were working needed the Chinese to mine the coal to keep the railroads moving. The railroads needed coal for fuel. So the Chinese that were brutally kicked out was now under military pr uh, protection and went back to Rock Spring to work. Now, on the bottom picture, you see Frederick B. He was there to try to sue the American government on behalf of the Chinese for the lives that were lost and the uh, buildings and assets the Chinese lost during these rioting. So the atmosphere was very brutal. And recently I was in Chinatown for the last three weeks talking with shop owners and, and I was shocked how pervasive this fear is, especially amongst the female, uh, Asian female and the elderly. They're really scared to be outside. When they're walking outside, they see some people coming their way. They're really worried something's gonna to happen to them. And this is the atmosphere the Chinese had at that time. 
San Francisco Chinatown up until the 1970s had only 8% of the Chinese population in California living in San Francisco's Chinatown. But by the mid 1870s with the recession and violence against Chinese being very overt, 25% of the Chinese in California ended up in San Francisco's Chinatown for self-protection. And so this was the atmosphere. And from that time, from the 1870s, San Francisco started all these ordinances against the laundries and other uh, ways of trying to get rid of the Chinese. So the laundry case, there were many, there were many ordinances, uh, not just uh, the one that uh, propelled as Yick Wall versus Hopkins, but there were many and many Chinese were arrested. And even for this case, over 150 Chinese were arrested and went to jail or had to pay the fine. But it was Yick Wall and another person, uh, Wall Lee. It was two cases that merged to, uh, to eventually ended up in the Supreme Court. So we have a picture of Peter Hopkins, the sheriff. He was sheriff for about two years and he was tasked to, uh, to arrest all the Chinese for operating without a permit from the Board of Supervisor, and Charles can talk about that later. But the picture itself is of Yik Wall, uh, the laundry. And you can see on the top, there are all these, uh, uh, the wooden uh, scaffolding to hang the laundries. And that was one of the things that the uh, ordinances was supposed to say that the Chinese uh, dry their laundries in these rooftop uh, situations. But we're lucky to have at least this picture. I think it was taken because it was submitted as evidence, uh, but I'm not positive. Then in San Francisco, we have a school uh, named Yik Wall to honor uh, this case, which was uh, quoted by the Supreme Court after the case more than 150 times uh, to point out uh, equal protection under law, uh, that the execution of the law also had to be equal. The problem is that Yik Wall is the name of the laundry and the people behind it is uh, Lee Yik, he owned the uh, laundry, Yik Wall, and we have uh, Li Wu, or Wu Li, or Yik Li, depends on whether you put first name last or last name first. But so uh, I want to clarify to everybody, if we're going to honor a person, we should honor Li Yik and Li Wu, because they, they were arrested and went to jail for this. So this is the end of my talk and I'll turn it over to the expert, Charles uh, McLean, who changed my life and my perception of uh, the contribution that the Chinese made to America. Charles is yours. Uh, you're muted, Charles. You're still muted. How about now? Okay. okay. Yes. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, David, uh, for the compliment, and uh, I'm glad I, I was able to have a positive impact on your uh, on your life. And uh, thanks a lot for the, uh, the presentation, which was quite good. I, I really liked the slides. I didn't realize that the uh, Tung Hing Tong still had a building in San Francisco. <laughs> um, yeah, this is a very interesting story, and I want to say a word about how I came to it. Um, Yikwo versus Hopkins is a, a case that's taught in every constitutional law class in, in any law school. It's a very important case uh, doctrinally. But the more I've thought about it, it seemed to me to be uh, just as interesting, if not more interesting, as a kind of a social and historical document. Because um, it sort of ran counter to the image that most people, I think, had of the Chinese as a rather passive group of people who uh, accepted with stoicism all the uh, hostile legislation that was passed against them. And here was a case 
brought by the Chinese attacking a uh, discriminatory, uh, uh, actually the discriminatory enforcement of a, of a law. So I, I started to look into this and it was quite clear that this was just the uh, tip of, the, of a, a very large iceberg that the Chinese in the 19th century were extremely litigious that they had been involved in numerous uh, court cases from a very early day, had been politically active too. They had a lot, they hired a, hired a lobbyist in the early 1860s to uh, represent them in Sacramento. But I was interested in particular in the, in the numerous cases they brought uh, contesting state, local, and eventually federal legislation. They were very successful in uh, challenging state and local laws <clears throat> that discriminated against them. They were less successful in challenge, much less successful in challenging federal legislation. That's a whole different story. But Yickel versus Hopkins is a, was a challenge to uh, a local law passed by the uh, Board of Supervisors of the city of San Francisco. A little uh, background, as David was saying, uh, laundries were the object of legislation earlier in the 1870s the uh, Board of Supervisors, as part of really a, an anti-Chinese package of laws, passed uh, an ordinance saying that uh, establishing a new uh, system of license fees for laundries, the, and it, it uh, was a, a, a system was graduated depending on how many horse-drawn carriages you had. Now, the Chinese were generally poorer than most other laundrymen. They didn't use horse-drawn carriages, but the city established the highest fees for those laundries that had no horse-drawn carriages. And it was very clearly aimed at the Chinese laundries. Well, they did in fact uh, hire uh, Henry Haight, former governor of California to uh, challenge the law. And the law was in fact struck down by a local court. They, they had raised the question of discrimination, but the court held that the law was invalid because it said it discriminated against the poor. It made it more difficult for poor laundrymen to, uh, to operate. And that was a case brought by the Tung Hing Tong, this Chinese laundrymen's guild which is an essential part of the, uh, of the story. Then uh, in, in 1880, the uh, Board of Supervisors uh, passed the first of a whole series of ordinances aimed at uh, the regulation of laundries. Uh, very difficult to actually keep track of all the, all the legislation. But this one said that um, if you wanted to operate a laundry that was not, that was not in a building built of uh, brick or stone, you needed to have the permission of the Board of Supervisors. And um, it was recognized, initially, the, the ordinance was worded to say that uh, a, a chi all Chinese laundries needed to have the permission of the Board of Supervisors. And then someone pointed out that this, this was pretty obviously <laughs> going to be struck down just on the, on the facial uh, wording of the, of the law. And so it, it, it was reworded to say that all laundries that didn't uh, operate in a building made of brick or stone needed to have the permission of the Board of Supervisors. This was in 1880. Whole series, uh, several other laundry laws were passed, and I discuss them in, the, in, in my book, but it, it, let me try to simplify, which is really a pretty complex story. I will mention one other law that was passed. The city passed a law saying that if you wanted to operate a laundry, you needed to have the permission of 12 citizens and taxpayers on the, on the block where your laundry was located. Now that was pretty clearly aimed at Chinese laundries because it, it was known it would be very difficult for Chinese laundries to secure 12, uh, the approval of 12 citizens. That law was challenged in federal court in 1882 uh, or 83. I think the case was called Kuang Wu. And uh, this was the first time the laundry laws were subjected to a federal court challenge. And the, the, uh, the federal court held that uh, this law was invalid, but again, stressing its, uh, it, it, the, the fact that it was an unreasonable and arbitrary interference with the right of someone to carry on a business and it tended to establish a monopoly. The, uh, the, the Chinese litigant had brought up the racially discriminatory animus behind the law, but the court didn't deal with that at all. It struck it down on this other ground. There was just an unreasonable interference with uh, someone's right to carry on a business. But the court did say it was very, was very aware of the uh, motivation behind the law and its likely effect. So that was the Kuang Wu case. Well, let's get back to to Yik, to, uh, to Yik Wo. So um, a whole series of other cases came up, other ordinances were came up. And uh, so we're now in uh, 1885. 
And the Chinese have now decided that they will try to secure the permission of the Board of Supervisors to operate in their wooden laundries. And many, many, uh, many Chinese laundry owners did apply for permission. The exact number is not entirely clear. Let us say roughly around 200. And they were all refused. Whereas, and many, uh, at least 150 were arrested for continuing to operate without the permission of the board. Whereas none of the uh, Caucasian laundry operators had been arrested. And again, the numbers are not entirely clear, but it appears that, uh, of, that of all the uh, Caucasian laundry operators who applied for permission, all of them got permission except for one. So the statistics showed a clear pattern of discriminatory enforcement against the uh, Chinese laundrymen. They brought two cases. The first case was the Yuko versus Hopkins case, which, which was a case brought in the California courts, in the California Supreme Court. Uh, Yuko had been arrested and uh, he brought a habeas corpus action directly to the California Supreme Court, raising a whole series of objections to the law, including the claim that it was clearly aimed at discriminating, uh, enabling the board to discriminate against the Chinese. But the California court um, did not accept his argument and ruled in favor of the ordinance. It said it was a legitimate police power measure, a legitimate way that there was uh, nothing facially wrong with the law and that the court was not convinced that the law was being enforced in a discriminatory fashion. So that was the California Supreme Court. Then Wo Li brought a separate action in the federal courts. And he brought it before a very sympathetic judge, a judge by the name of Lorenzo Sawyer, making the same kinds of claims. But for procedural reasons, Sawyer felt that he could not overrule the opinion of the California Supreme Court. But in his opinion, he makes it very clear that he knew what the law's purpose was, that it was to make life difficult for the Chinese. Part of this whole uh, project in California that uh, it's a, if we make life difficult enough for the Chinese, they will, they will, they won't come or they'll, they'll leave. So he refused to overrule the California Supreme Court. But both cases, both the Yip Wo case and the Wo Lee case, one a state court case, the other a federal case, went up to the U.S. Supreme Court, and there it was uh, submitted on briefs. There was no oral argument before the court. But as David was saying, the, uh, the Chinese were well represented. They had a, several attorneys. And Hall McAllister, one of the most famous attorneys in 19th century California history, was the lead lawyer. And here they raised all the claims had been, that had been made in these uh, lower court cases. And the US Supreme Court decided to address them head on. And it, uh, in a unanimous decision, held that the ordinance was, uh, was void. The ordinance has said you needed the permission of the Board of Supervisors to operate in a wooden laundry. And its reasoning was uh, quite interesting. It said, uh, first of all, <clears throat> the law is bad on its face in that it vests in the Board of Supervisors total discretion as to who can and who can't be a laundryman. Now, one thing we need to stress is that uh, both Yikwo and Wo Li had secured the necessary health permit, sanitation permit, and fire permit from the requisite authorities in San Francisco. So they, they had jumped through all the right regulatory hoops, but they had been turned down. So the court said the, uh, the ordinance uh, looks bad on its face because it seems to give the Board of Supervisors complete uh, discretion to, term, to determine who can and who can't operate a laundry. It doesn't provide any standards. Does it provide any rules to what you need, what, what, what you need to conform to, to be, able, to be able to get a permit? It simply says the board can decide yes or no. It doesn't even have to give a reason. And I remember going through the newspaper accounts of the, um, uh, the applications made by the Chinese laundrymen. I was able to pull up, I think, about 190 different uh, news stories. And in every one, all you get is a uh, report saying that the board turned down the applicant, no reason given what whatsoever. So the court says this is th this law doesn't look very good on its face, but it says because it looks it looks like it could be it, it could be used in a very arbitrary fashion. But then it says we don't need to hypothesize about this because we can see how it's been used in an arbitrary fashion. Here we have this. Uh, 
minority group, which is despised by the majority, and the Board of Supervisors turns down, turns down every application made by a Chinese laundryman, whereas it approves the applications made by the uh, Caucasian laundryman. Or at the very least, it didn't. It arrested a whole bunch of Chinese and arrested none of the, of the uh, Caucasians. So the court says here we have a perfect example of what's wrong with the law because it's being used now in a racially discriminatory fashion against this despised minority group. And the court says this is against both the Constitution and the law. This is the first time the Supreme Court says that the U.S. Constitution. The 14th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution protects aliens as well as citizens. The 14th Amendment says, among other things, no state shall deprive any person of due process of law nor deny to any person the equal protection of the laws. Earlier in the amendment, citizens are spoken of, but this clause in the amendment speaks of persons and that the, uh, the federal, a lower federal court had held a little earlier that the 14th Amendment applied to the Chinese. They were, could not be citizens. They couldn't be naturalized, but they were constitutional persons. And so they could avail themselves of the um, 14th Amendment. In addition, um, the court said it violated the Civil Rights Act of 1870, which also spoke of per the rights of persons as opposed to citizens. By the way, the Chinese have been very instrumental in getting the language of that statute passed. So that, so that it mentioned, uh, mentioned persons as opposed to uh, citizens. So the court said that the uh, San Francisco ordinance uh, violated the Civil Rights Act of 1870 as well. And finally, there was the Burlingame Treaty. In 1868, China and the United States had negotiated a treaty which had a, a so-called most favored nation clause. And what it said was that the Chinese should be entitled to the same rights and privileges as, as were citizens and subjects of the most favored nation. So they enjoyed the same protections that uh, aliens from Europe uh, uh, enjoyed. So they had three strings to their bow here. They had the 14th Amendment Equal Protection Clause. They had the uh, Civil Rights Act of 1870, and they had the Burlingame Treaty. Now, the equal protection analysis is very interesting. The court said, yes, the law is neutral on its face. It was, it was, it, it simply said that anybody wanting to operate a wooden laundry needed the permission of the board, but it said it was being applied in a discriminatory fashion. And for the first time, the court said the law that was neutral, that was neutral on its face, but was being applied in a discriminatory fashion, violated the uh, constitution. So this was an important uh, uh, holding of the court as well. So that so the uh, the Chinese laundry won won the case of a ma major major victory. And what happened was uh, in its wake, the board of supervisors did revise the law. It now uh, established a set of standards that you needed to meet in order to get a license. And many Chinese laundrymen were able to get licenses. No longer was it up to the pure arbitrary uh, discretion of the board of supervisors. Now this is an important laundry case, but there were other laundry cases that came up right around the same time. Um, David was mentioning that the mid 1880s were a really terrible time for the Chinese. There were a lot of anti-Chinese riots that were being expelled from cities. There was a huge movement afoot in the state, uh, almost a concerted movement to make life really difficult for the Chinese. And so in addition to San Francisco, the city of Oakland, the city of uh, San Jose, the city of Stockton, the city of Napa, the city of Modesto, they all passed laundry ordinances aimed really at the Chinese. Um, let me say a bit about uh, the Stockton ordinance. The uh, Stockton ordinance, clearly motivated by anti-Chinese sentiment, all you need to do is read the newspaper accounts of the uh, discussions in the, uh, the local legislative body. It was designed to, to, to make life difficult for Chinese laundrymen. And so an ordinance was passed that basically said there could be no laundries in the central part of the city. They all had to relocate to what was really swampland on the outside, on the outskirts of the city. Um, the, the Napa ordinance also was phrased in a, in a similar way. And the Chinese laundrymen in Stockton successfully challenged uh, that law as well, a case called the uh, Tai Loi uh, versus Stockton. Um, and if you read the uh, background to the Oakland and San Jose ordinances, they were both patterned after the San Francisco ordinance, both requiring permission of a, a legislative board to operate a laundry. And it's very, very clear that they're part of this 
overall strategy of trying to make life as very as difficult as possible for the Chinese. This was a, this was a, a, a constant theme in uh, the history of California, going back actually to 1862, uh, when uh, the, the, the state passed something called the Chinese police tax, a tax that applied only to Chinese. And that was successfully challenged by the Chinese in, in the California Supreme Court. So um, you have to see these laundry ordinances in context. They're not just uh, health and safety measures. They are in part, they're parts of the, of the laundry ordinance that are perfectly legitimate, but they're also obviously designed to make life difficult for Chinese laundrymen. So it's a very interesting episode in American legal and constitutional history, and also in the social history of the United States, because here you have this uh, guild, the, the Tung Hing Tong, the Chinese Laundrymen's Guild, which is very, very active from the get-go, from its very uh, start. And it's very involved in litigation, in supporting litigation aimed at overturning discriminatory laws. And it runs so counter uh, to the image of the Chinese that I think used to, uh, this is no longer true to the same extent, that used to be encountered, that they were these passive stoic people who basically didn't, uh, didn't do much to uh, respond to hostile legislation. Whereas the, the story is just the opposite. Now, one final word, this is beyond the purview of Yi Kuo. The Chinese were very successful in challenging state and local laws. They had the constitution primarily to, prevent, to protect them. The constitution protected persons against hostile state legislation. The civil rights law of 1870 protected persons against hostile state and local legislation. But what the constitution did not do was protect people against hostile federal legislation. So when the exclusion acts started to be passed, uh, the Chinese were in a much more difficult legal position. They challenged every one of the exclusion acts, but un unfortunately for them, uh, the court said, basically when it comes to the federal government, the federal government's right to regulate immigration, the constitution, we might say stops at the water's edge. The federal government has almost unconstrained power to regulate immigration. Now that has changed since then. There have been modifications since then, but that was the doctrine that came down in the 19th century. So Chinese very successful in challenging uh, state, and, uh, state and local laws, not so successful in challenging federal laws, although they were able to modify them to some extent. But Yikwa, of course, is one of the really big, big cases uh, brought by the Chinese, mainly because, as I say, it's the first U.S. Supreme Court case to say that aliens were entitled to the protection of the 14th Amendment. And, uh, of course, for this, uh, this idea that a law can be uh, neutral on its face, but if applied in a discriminatory fashion, it runs afoul of the 14th Amendment. I'll leave it, I'll leave it there. Thank you, Charles. Uh, now we're going to go to Nick Bartel, who's going to hopefully tell you how you can pass the message along and what you can do with this information. Nick? Thank you everybody for coming and greetings from a very foggy San Francisco. Um, I'm gonna share with you some of the things that the Association of Chinese Teachers or TACT have been working on. TACT is 52 years old now. And we've been working most recently with the San Francisco State University Asian American Studies Department, the Public Library and Square and Circle Club to put together some uh, workshops for teachers. And we've completed a couple, but the one that the most recent one is Writing Justice, APIA in the Courts. And all our materials are free and available to teachers and visitors uh, to our website. And that includes parents, of course. And we hope you will visit and spread the word to teachers in your school district if you'd like to see some of these topics brought up in your classroom. We're still working on many of them. And most of these are now targeted for the eighth grade US history and high school courses. Okay, this is one unit. It is called San Francisco's Harassment Ordinances of the 1860s to the early 1900s. And you can see here one of five uh, chapters of this is the laundry ordinances. And that's where I'm going to go right now. 
you can see that uh, more than three fourths of the laundries in San Francisco in the late 19th century were owned and operated by Ch Chinese, but the other fourth certainly um, resented their competition. And laundries were often the targets of the workingmen's party that cried out the Chinese must go. And you probably heard about Dennis Kearney, who was the leader of that group. And many advertisements for laundry products had an anti-Chinese message as well. And here you can see some of those. And the middle one here is an example of, it's actually a trading card. And I didn't know there would ever be something like this, but that's what it is. It's a set of trading cards, like we trade um, baseball cards. That was in a set. And you can evidently buy them on, uh, on eBay. In a very interesting book, about the Chinese laundry survival on Gold Mountain, John Jung talks about how the Chinese diaspora moved into the um, Midwest and East and South largely by entrepreneurs going into the laundry business. That was even before um, or at a greater rate than grocery stores or restaurants. And here you can see something from the WASP magazine, Illustrated WASP, that says the Chinese must go, but who keeps them? In the middle here, you can see, if you look right here on the epaulette of this donkey, it says DK. Can you imagine who that is? That's Dennis Kearney. And in effect, they're calling Kearney a jackass. And they say that the reason that uh, the Chinese are here is because they offer these services and the people want them. And the, the WASP, by the way, was a very anti-Chinese workers magazine, but he, this is what they thought of Dennis Kearney. So when Kearney was arrested, I'm sure that many of the Chinese uh, uh, organizations were, were very happy to see him in jail for six months. Now, he did not go into jail because of his work against the Chinese, but actually he, he led people in protest up, up to Knob Hill and uh, to the, the big four and tried to get uh, them to uh, keep Chinese out. And he, he was basically a socialist activist. And one case um, that is in this section of the five ordinances is the laundry um, ordinances. And you can see here, the laundry's name, uh, Yikwa, has a translation of, um, let's see, benefit and peace or harmony. And this is a picture of the elementary school in San Francisco named Yikwa. And I believe that a former principal of this school, Shirlene uh, Nakano, is one of the people that's out listening to this presentation right now. Hi, Shirlene. Now, you may think this is very progressive of San Francisco to have uh, this name applied to a school, but at the same time, we have James Denman Middle School, and that's named after the superintendent of San Francisco schools who refused to allow for the integration of schools in the 1860s and was very racist. Another program that you can find on, uh, on the TACT website is uh, fighting for equal protection through the courts. And I'm gonna show you just some very fast slides, just segments of these, just so you can get a flavor of it and come back later and see it. These, by the way, will are available on YouTube, so you can just sit by and listen. Uh, Claudia Jung is the person that has narrated these, and uh, I hope you'll enjoy following it along. But could whites get away with murder? especially when the laws were as fierce as tigers. Now, members of the Working Men's Party got this, uh, this anti-Chinese article into the second constitution of California. The state legislature had the authority to protect the states and cities from the Chinese who were seen as dangerous. 
corporations were forbidden to hire Chinese. Uh, they couldn't work on public works. And cities and towns were able to remove Chinese out of the city or town limits or into certain neighborhoods. Now, when many of the cases actually came up, these, these were defeated because um, it didn't go very far. But that was written into the state constitution and most of those people were from San Francisco that got that in. So could, uh, could whites get away with murder? Uh, this is the case really asked the question, did Chinese lives matter? And um, Hall was a person who killed a Chinese um, a minor and he was sentenced to be hung. That sounds like justice, but his lawyer uh, said, we appeal that and the uh, verdict was that um, the Chinese from the Chinese, I'm sorry, from the California State Supreme Court said that Chinese along with blacks and Indians uh, were denied the right to testify against whites in a court of law. So Hall was freed of the murder charges because of some of the witnesses being Chinese. Even more telling about this uh, was what happened Um, with the judges, and you can see that the judges actually were, this is pretty frightening. Chief Justice Murray said the same rule which would admit them to testify would admit them to all the legal equal rights of citizenship. He wrote, we would soon see them at the polls, in the jury box, upon the bench, and in the legislative halls. So you can see that this um, judge certainly um, had his problems with Chinese. And it, as uh, Charles McLean's book says, it was um, one of them contained some of the most offensive racial rhetoric to be found in the annals of California appellate jurisprudence. And what was the effect of this? I'm going to skip through some of this rather quickly, but um, some people criticized the decision, including an African-American civil rights leader. And this is very interesting that you see uh, African-American support from the Chinese way back. In 1869, this speech by um, Douglas is very interesting. And what became of this offensive law? It was that 14th Amendment again that overrode the decision in People versus Hall and Chinese, Black and Indian witnesses were finally allowed to testify in court against whites. And in 1872, the California legislature repealed the law and eliminated it from the penal code. But even if they could testify, would they believe, be believed by a jury? And I'm going to skip through a lot of this because of time but you can find that in many cases, um, people that were um, had committed crimes, charged with murders, had witnesses, in spite of the eyewitness accounts, a verdict of not guilty for each of the six men was returned by the jury after one hour and 15 minutes. And the crowded courtroom was filled with the wildest enthusiasm when the verdict was read. This happened again and again. So the question comes up, did Chinese lives matter? And it's very similar. It echoes today with Black Lives Matter. This led to much violence. And I'm going to go through this again very quickly. I hope you can come back and read this. In 1877, there was a riot in San Francisco. It was a time of great economic problems. The country was deep into the long depression and San Francisco was hit hard. The Bank of California failed. Unemployment was about 20% and thousands were being fed daily by churches and charity, uh, charities. And you see this similar kind of economic problems with certain communities today. The riot uh, was actually started by the working men. Uh, they turned into a mob and it uh, led to destruction and it lasted for four days. Again, targeting uh, laundries. 
But down here, you can see that with the help of a thousand public safety volunteers or more, they had some allies that helped keep the peace. There were riots in Denver, Colorado, and Dave talked a little bit about this. Anti-Chinese violence flared in Seattle and Tacoma, Washington. And again, Though 13 white men were tried in court for the riot, not a single one was ever convicted of a crime. This will just keep on happening. In Rock Springs, 15 or more were, I'm sorry, 28 Chinese men were killed, 15 or more wounded, homes and businesses burned. And those arrested as suspects in the riot were released a little more than a month later. On their release, they were met by several hundred men, women, and children and treated to a regular ovation, according to the New York Times. No person was ever convicted in the violence at Rock Springs. Here's a cartoon by Thomas Nast. And the diplomats satirically state, there is no doubt of the United States being at the head of an enlightened nations. So, this is only one of 153 cases of racial violence in the West during the 1870s to 1890s, including in Los Angeles and San Jose. And does that, that leads us into the Asian American hate crimes uh, in modern times or anti-Asian hate crimes in modern times. So I think we need to look at um, what are the economic situation, the background at that time? And was it like the time of the racist attacks against the early immigrants in the West? What happened in the courts? And how did people, Chinese and others, react to the verdicts? And was there some justice for the victims? And this case, I imagine you have heard of uh, this case of the murder of Vincent Chin. Uh, two unemployed white auto workers um, confronted him in a bar and one said, by the way, this was 100 years after the passage of the Exclusion Act, it's because of you that we are out of work. Doesn't that echo with the history? And several hundred people originally invited to Chin's wedding instead attended his funeral. Two men pleaded guilty to manslaughter and what happened? One murderer was originally sentenced to 25 years in prison, but the conviction was overturned on appeal. They served no jail time, were given three years probation, fined $3,000 in order to pay $780 in court costs. Later, later, a civil suit for the unlawful death of Vincent Chin was settled out of court in 1987. One was ordered to pay $50,000 to his family the other was ordered to pay one, one and a half million dollars. Now, Vincent Chin's death was a turning point for the Asian American community, said US Representative Judy Chu, the first Chinese American woman to be elected to Congress. We began organizing and fighting for change like never before. And here we have more hate crimes today. And David, you mentioned about the fear that's in San Francisco, especially of the elderly um, and especially the women. People have been pushed down, hit, cut, name calling, spit upon, and kind of a new call for exclusion, property damage, and attacks on Market Street. And this woman fought back. At least this time, there's support from uh, President Biden who condemned the rise in hate crimes against Asian Americans. And many people blame President Trump for his use of changing the coronavirus. He changed it to the Chinese virus and called it the Gong flu. And um, I think he could be criticized for that. In the recent hate crime support uh, anti-Asian hate crimes is supported from the uh, federal government. And communities and people of all colors are coming together in support. So again, it's, I think, a turning point. And if anybody uh, has harassment uh, because of the COVID-19 or racism, there's somebody to report it to. 
and this is um, this is how it can be done. There are many links that students are being taught how to uh, report crimes if it happens in their families. So I'm optimistic. Uh, young people are getting involved. Young people are rejecting hate. And I love this. Uh, everyone is human, just like we're all human. All branches sprout from the same tree. Each branch helps the tree to catch sunlight. All branches different together. And this was a 12 year old's uh, Sabina Cottrell's uh, award winning poster. We are all branches of the same tree. And this was from a, a contest sponsored by the Anti Defamation League. So that I hope that school districts learn of this kind of contest and get their uh, schools and their students involved in it. Why I'm optimistic, young people are speaking up to racism and um, you, have, you will have a lot of resources. I hope you can listen to this girl and how she confronts uh, racism and the interaction that shows between uh, this student and her mother and some of the people in the school, the counselor and her friends about um, being called names. So I know that many parents and uh, grandparents and uh, even teachers are having to talk to the students about racism in a way that they didn't have to a little over a year ago. So the talk of the African-American parents, what they used to have um, to talk to their kids about racism is now uh, within the Asian uh, American community. So I'll, I'll be asking later, have you had, a, um, had the talk yet and what worked and what would you recommend to other parents? I hope some of, the part, some of you listening will participate in this discussion a little bit later. Um, when should incidents be reported? And do you feel prepared for the talk? And we have some resources that we have found. This one is a good one. It's by a video by the Try Guys. It, it has uh, 12 different parts. And it says that we need to get more familiar. We need to become more familiar with some of these topics in order to raise them uh, with, our, with our children. You will be receiving a, a, this, which is, it, it's a copy of our uh, three pages that will link directly into tax uh, special collections. And uh, it, we hope it will help you with history resources and resources to talk, to help you talk with your children or grandchildren about anti-Asian racism and hate. Um, as you can see over on the right, these two arrows, you just got a very slender sampling of these two, um, these two products that we put together. And there are many, many more. Please take a look at them when you can. Don't worry, there will not be a test on this. Um, this has been part of the APIA biography project as well. And there are many resources, including some color, coloring book activities for the very young and some um, interviews with authors who have written children's books about racial issues. And I'm going to jump down here where it talks about books for children and teens, see recommended books. Um, I think that literature is a, an excellent way to bring up these topics. Uh, it'll emphasize the importance of family stories, literature, poetry, and art to connect with the past, seek solutions, rejoice in achievements, and explore identity. So there are also a list of resources that talk about how to talk to uh, kids about anti-Asian racism and teaching and talking to kids about race. I'm going to give you a quick summary of two of those where the arrows are. This is a brief summary of how to talk to kids, give them a context, use critical thinking, word matters, check yourself, supporting API kids and families. Um, it has some good ideas there. This is another one, the 10, 10 tips for teaching and talking to kids about race. 
I'm going to jump over to number th three. It says, choose books and toys that include persons of different races and ethnicities. Visit museums with ex exhibits about a range of cultures and religions. And I want to point out that this, it's called Meet Three Third Graders. It's about Mamie Tape and uh, Sylvia Men um, Mendez. And uh, the, this is Linda Brown of the Brown versus the Board of Education. Three girls that had a great deal to do with changing how schools um, become integrated or at least are established. So, um, number eight, it says lift up freedom fighters. And there's a new book that you may or may not be aware of. It's called Awesome Asian Americans. And it features 20 uh, heroes. And it includes such heroes as Bruce Lee and uh, um, Molly G, a judge, and many other people that um, I think young people today need to be aware of, uh, become aware of these are heroes for us today. Um, there are many other resources, but I want to jump down to the bottom part and thank many of these organizations that like the 1882 Foundation has a commitment to curriculum. And I see that they have some kind of work with New York's um, Department of Education where teachers that if they listen in on some of these activities that are online, they can get a credit, um, kind of an in-service cre credit and let's see, quiet before unearthing anti-Asian violence, amazing panel discussions and Far East Deep South documentary and Chinese Historical Society. These are resources that are um, very effective and the deep uh, quiet before is having something on Thursday. So you might want to get involved in this now uh, listen in on this panel discussion. The 1882 Foundation has presentations often in the Far East Deep South and the Chinese American Heritage Foundation are all resources that I think we, I've learned so much from them and I do appreciate what they're doing and many more. So is there a reason for me to be pessimistic or cautious? Um, I learned that Republican controlled legislatures in at least half a dozen states have either already passed legislation or, or are currently advancing measures that would ban or limit the teaching of something I never heard of, critical race theory in public schools. So listen to this, um, listen for this in the newspaper and in the news. If you are in Ohio or Tennessee or Texas, these are issues that will limit discussion just like limit voting, there's limit discussion in the schools um, that promote, uh, um, that, that kind of limit the white privilege that has been going on. So watch for that. Finally, I'll ask, what can you do about Asian, uh, anti-Asian and Pacific Islander American hate? Uh, parents, grandparents, and adults become knowledgeable search for intersections with other groups, volunteer to talk to a class or school assembly about an Asian American history topic, either in class or guest lecture online, donate a book or two to your school's library, keep connected with other parents in the neighbor and neighbors, keep in touch with school counselors and teachers if needed, and have the talk and a continuing dialogue with your child about racism and xenophobia as appropriate to age and community circumstances. I hope that teachers, I'm just going to go jump to this last one. Don't wait for APA Heritage Month in May, integrate units throughout the year. Um, this, these units should be part of American history, not just separate units. And by the way, if these are not part of your uh, school curriculum, we hope that parents will work with uh, their, their kids about bringing that into the 
at least you're having your kids involved through some of these resources which we provide. Okay. Thank you. Oh, I talked too much. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, uh, that's absolutely fine, Nick. Uh, you're really the solution. <laughs> uh, I think Charles and I would bring up the topic and those are really good uh, solutions and I hope parents out there, grandparents will feel a obligation and take this opportunity to use these curriculum and these suggestions to talk with their kids. Uh, I'll throw this back to uh, Chinese American Heritage Foundation for questions. Uh, are there okay, any? Okay, great. We have uh, uh, several questions. And I'll start with the first one that was emailed uh, prior to the webcast. It said, uh, what cases are typically taught in law schools regarding the Equal Protection Clause other than Yik Wu versus Hopkins? Charles? Well, <clears throat> I'm not sure I know. I think um, it depends on the teacher and the, and the course. Uh, I mean, what Obviously, I mean, what what cases are taught regarding the equal protection clause generally, or the equal protection clause in the Chinese? If it, you're talking about the equal protection clause generally, obviously there's a whole string of cases involving African Americans, uh, culminating in Brown versus Board of Education. Um, many cases involving uh, African Americans, um, and. Uh, I mean, yeah, there, there are lots of cases on the equal protection clause that uh, I, I couldn't catalog them. I think it depends on the on the instructor and the, the book that's being used, but it's a major subject of discussion in any constitutional law class. Okay, great. Thank you very much. The next question is, knowing that Chinese immigrants did not come from a country with a democracy, what gave the Chinese leaders such faith in the U.S. courts? That is an excellent question. <laughs> that is a really good question. And it's one that I've pondered, um, pondered quite a lot when I was researching the book and I've thought about it since. What was it that caused the Chinese at a very early stage in the immigration to recognize that the courts would be there to help them? Um, I, I, I don't know what the answer is. I, I, and I don't know a great deal about the about what was going on in China. I do know that there were these associations that existed in China, including craft guilds, place associations, that did, um, my understanding is that they were there to protect individuals against overweening bureaucrats. And uh, for example, um, if a group of Chinese from Guang, uh, 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 Guangzhou went to Beijing, they would organize a, a Guangdong association. And if they got into trouble with local bureaucrats, the association would be there to, to help them. The other thing, and I'm a little less clear on this, I'm hardly an expert, is that apparently the Chinese in China were much more litigious than they've been given credit for. Uh, we're learning a lot more about litigation in traditional China and apparently the Chinese in China were much more prone to go to court, uh, sometimes even contesting official decisions than uh, heretofore has been, uh, has been the case. I think um, th they were helped too by, I think the, the, the Protestant missionaries were often a bridge to, to lawyers, that they, uh, they told them that uh, lawyers could help them out. I'll give you an example. Um, I was doing so, I knew that the Presbyterians had been very active in Chinatown. And I went to the Presbyterian se Seminary in, in uh, San Anselmo to look at some of their archives. And lo and behold, I came across this fascinating series of letters where a Presbyterian missionary in San Francisco, this I think was in 1860 or 1861, wrote to his superiors in uh, Philadelphia saying that after church services, some of the leaders of the Chinese community had come up to him and asked him uh, if he could help them find a lobbyist 
to represent them in Sacramento because there was a lot of anti-Chinese legislation pending in the legislature. Could he, the minister, help them find a lobbyist? This is in 1861, very, very early in the history of the uh, of, of, uh, Chinese immigration. And he did, I don't know who the lobbyist was, but he did find a lobbyist to represent them. So um, they quit, you know, these were smart people. They, they quickly became aware of their surroundings. They knew, they knew there were courts and that uh, the, the courts were there, had been there to help some people, maybe they could help them as well. So I think there are a whole bunch of things that factored into this. I think it's very important that the Chinese were organized in, were organized in associations. They had their, they had their trade guilds, they had their place associations, they had their family associations, they had the six companies. And of course, much later, they had the Chinese consulate established in 1878. So I think there is a background in China that plays into this. And then I think when they got to the US, these are, these are, these are bright people. They're aware of what's going on around them. And they became aware that they might possibly be able to get some help from the courts. But this is a very, very good question. Well, for me, the last two decades, we're getting more Chinese documents to give us some idea from the Chinese side what they did. And even before the uh, 1860 with uh, Reverend Loomis, that's who the, the minister, the Presbyterian minister the Chinese went to, the Chinese in 1849, well, we always, get the message that the Chinese came because they were poor, starving, illiterate young men and they had civil war in China. That's why the Chinese came to California. But it turns out to be another narrative. Uh, we know 1849, by November 1849, 300 Chinese merchants met at the Canton restaurant on Jackson Street to hire a representative, Salim Woodworth, to represent the Chinese with the white community. Now, you have to ask yourself, if they came for gold in early 1849, how did they end up with a restaurant that can seat 300 merchants uh, serving a meal? 300 seat restaurant today will take us more than a year to build. So these people came with a plan. If they were illiterate, poor, where are they going to get the capital? They came with plans. Now, by 18, early 1850, according to Hubert Howell Bancroft, who wrote the history on California, there were only about 700 Chinese in all of California. But 300 of them, half of them at least, met to hire a representative. They were merchants that came. They, you had to have money for passage. That was a whole year's wage to buy a ticket to come here. And so the earlier people that came to San Francisco were not the laborers from Taishan. They were the merchants mainly from Zhongshan uh, in those days would be called Shansan. And they had more people in the Yongwa District Association, their district association, than Taishanese all through the 1850s. They had the most members. So we have to change that narrative. The first people that came were really business people and they took the opportunities to, the opportunity to make a lot of money because Hong Kong was the nearest port to California until the Transcontinental Railroad was built. That was the fastest way to get supply to the West Coast, two months, two and a half months, as opposed to five, six months from the East Coast. So that narrative changed. So the Chinese have been hiring these representatives from day one, from 1849. That's a great, uh, great answer, and that leads to uh, our next question, which is, uh, were there other businesses or occupations which were restricted by law in San Francisco? Nick? You well, venture a lot of ordinances. I mean, uh, I think you have to 
broaden the vision to include the, the state of California as a whole, which uh, the state passed many laws aimed at the Chinese. And as, a, as, as uh, someone was pointing out, there's a provision in the 1879 constitution, I think David mentioned it, which is captioned Chinese and has a whole bunch of uh, provisions uh, aimed, aimed at the Chinese. Uh, no corporation could employ any Chinese. Uh, cities were empowered to remove the Chinese from uh, their, their uh, premises. There was uh, the state legislature at one point uh, passed a law forbidding Chinese from fishing in the state's waters. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, what it, laundries were a particular focus because the laundry business was a, a very prominent part of the Chinese presence in, in California, but um, they were harassed in many, in many ways. Um, yeah. All right. So it is now 8.16 and we have kept the panel much longer than we had anticipated. I want to thank you very much. There, um, there are more questions that were on the list that were asked and we'll provide those questions to you. And uh, if you want to answer them offline, that'd be great. And uh, there was a question about uh, whether this uh, presentation will be, um, since it's being recorded, would it be shown later? And we'll work that with the CAHF and we'll make that available, okay? Uh, I want to bring out one more thing. Uh, Nick's resources will be emailed to everyone that register for this Zoom. So you will get all that material. Okay, fantastic. I wanna thank you very much on behalf of the CAHF for your insightful uh, presentations. Uh, this is amazing. This is very educational. And again, thank you very much. And thank you to all the participants that joined. Have a good evening.